Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute um, privilege to be part of this. Thank you so much to the My Society team to, to pulling this off. This is an absolute uh, uh, triumph so far. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's absolutely brutal to follow up a, such a brilliant and vivid speaker such as uh, Nanjala. And I, I, I'm afraid you're stuck with a much more stiffer German presentation now. But I think that a couple of the things that Nanjala mentioned um, um, kind of lead in quite nicely into what I'm going to try to say today. Um, so I will try to give you a little bit of a macro perspective or meso perspective on digital tools and constitution making before your own. Um, Rob and Colvin are going to give us a more detailed perspective on recent developments in Iceland. So let me kick this off by, by showing you how participation in constitution making looked like for a long time. Um, it looked more or less like this. Um, constitution making was essentially um, hourglass shaped. It's, it was a task that was mostly reserved to elites. And if involved at all, citizens may have elected some representatives at the beginning of a process. Um, in a constitution drafting assembly or adopted the draft via, via uh, referendum. Now, while this worked for quite a long time, it does not seem to be a particularly viable um, uh, solution anymore in the, in the digital age. Nangela mentioned a couple of problems. Um, we are facing a representative uh, crisis of uh, representative government. There's increasing distrust, distrust um, and detachment uh, of citizens from institutions and governing elites. Um, there's a decline of collective engagement in politics, in traditional politics through political parties, for instance. And there's increasing politics that really drives search for democratic innovations in constitution making and, and elsewhere. Um, so, so the need to accommodate new forms of um, political engagement is fueling longer standing calls for increasing participation in constitution making and beyond. So today I'll focus on three brief case studies just to illustrate how technology is, is gradually changing the design of constitution making and how it, we are trying to, to bring in people uh, into these uh, processes more effectively. So let me start by <clears throat> asking why participation is important. So I think that constitutions and constitution making processes in, in particular are a prime field of, of um, um, public participation. Um, and they are believed to be um, to serve as a key mechanism to battle uh, the, the chaotic pluralism, if you will, will of uh, that marks many societies today. today. Um, so the first argument for public participation is a theoretical one. Um, you know, the the source of a constitution's authority is widely recognized to be the people, and in a democratic society, um, the people should have a say of uh, about the rules um, they live under. Um, and this applies preeminently to its most fundamental rules. So practically speaking, this means that constitution making should be participatory and involve as many citizens as possible. The second argument is a more um, is a more recent argument. Um, public participation in constitution making is assumed to make constitutional text uh, substantively better. Um, this has gained this argument has gained significant traction over the last couple of um, years, um, <clears throat> namely that including a wide range of people allows constitution drafters uh, to tap into the collective intelligence of the people. So. Um, put differently, the idea is to um, use crowds for idea generation. And the last argument um, is that participation in constitution making should help to form a we of a group of individuals. Um, ideally, the more open, inclusive, transparent uh, process is, um, the more we will create a sense of ownership, legitimacy, and strengthen democratic constitutional orders and, and ensure their stability. So as I go through uh, the, the um, three cases, I want you to keep in mind maybe um, uh, um, the question of uh, reaching a better constitutional text and building some sort of communality in a society when we think of, um, of um, impacts. So I'll now briefly go through my three case studies, um, Iceland, Mexico City, and Chile to illustrate um, my points. So the Icelandic case was 
arguably, no, it was the trailblazer for many other tech enabled processes that followed. And, and if I say anything wrong, um, um, we have three experts here who will correct me uh, surely. Um, so Iceland um, combined three forms of public participation. <clears throat> randomly selected deliberative uh, fora at the very beginning of the constitution making process, self-selected online participation during the drafting phase, and a non-binding referendum at the ratifying stage. And the process was triggered by the Icelandic financial crisis and the breakdown of the people's trust um, in, the, in its political class. And this mistrust against the politicians arguably also characterized the whole constitution making process as politicians were largely excluded from, from it. So in the original plan, the only source of public input for the process was meant to come from a one day deliberative national forum. Um, and this forum brought together 950 randomly <clears throat> selected Icelanders to produce a set of core values and visions that were to serve as the basis for, for the new constitution. But the Constitutional Council, um, which a group of 25 uh, elected non-professional drafters, um, decided to continue the debate to the public and to open the process um, to the public. Um, the council members started to publish work in progress constitutional drafts and to solicit input via a dedicated website and other social media platforms. And what emerged was a, an iterative drafting um, process. Um, 12 versions of constitutional drafts were uh, elaborated by a means of a, of a, a kind of feedback loop between citizens and the Constitutional Council. Now, during this process, from the public. Um, but due to the ad hoc manner which the input was solicited, there was no systematic data analysis. Um, but um, since the input size was relatively manageable and drafters, um, drafters were personally able to respond to most queries, comments and suggestions. And ultimately 29 or roughly 10% of suggestions uh, ended up in the final constitutional text. Um, my colleague, uh, Alexander Hudson from the Max Planck Institute wrote something about this. Now, while the relative impact of this form of participation is remarkable, it also highlights some of the problems of self-selection in broad scale participation. The proposal came from only 204 individuals, 77% um, of whom were men, mostly between 40 and 65 years old. So in this very central drafting phase of the process, a relatively small group exerted significantly more influence on the process than others. Um, um, now, once the drafting process was over, Icelanders then approved the constitution with a two-thirds majority in a non-binding referendum. Um, but the process ground to a halt eventually at Parliament, um, which failed to ratify the constitutional draft. Um, I think that even if the draft constitution was not ratified in the end, and the fact that Iceland's size and, um, and um, <clears throat> so homogenous socioeconomic uh, makeup is hardly comparable to other contexts, the Icelandic case still set new standards for public participation in constitution making. Um, it offered unprecedented access uh, of the public to the drafting of a constitutional text. And it also highlighted um, the importance of the involvement of political actors um, and some of the shortcomings of selected, um, self-selected public participation. Now, my next case is Mexico City. Um, in Mexico City, the, the constitution making process marked the transformation from the capital district of Mexico City into a federal state. Um, here, policymakers focused predominantly on the idea generation phase um, and on mass participation. And to increase and diversify participation, they combined different forms of participation and found ways of linking them to the work of the drafting body. Now, the first step was an online and on offline survey, which was used um, to stimulate interest in the process and creative thinking about the citizens' relationship um, with the city. Um, after completing the survey, each respondent received a unique identifier, which allowed them to link their answers with specific provisions in the draft constitutional text 
um, that addressed that input. Um, and I think that this was a particularly interesting method to fo for fostering and sustaining um, the public's interest in the process. Um, then um, policymakers teamed up with change.org to solicit substantive submissions for the constitution. And this process was basically a, a petitioning system by setting particular thresholds. Um, 5,000 signatures meant that the submission would be sent to the drafting committee's legal experts for review. Uh, 10,000 signatures or more um, petitioners were invited to present the ideas to the drafting committee and 5, um, uh, 50,000 um, signatures meant an audience um, with the mayor. <coughs> um, <coughs> this method basically kept input manageable for drafters, but it also left relatively little room for more nuanced debate uh, and exchange of arguments um, and the um, competitive or, or viral um, format um, meant that many less popular proposals did not get seen. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that this relatively simple method was accessible, it was well received and effective. And um, by the end of the process, more than 400,000 uh, viewers, uh, users viewed the proposals and 280,000 people signed on to 341 different petitions. And the new constitution entails 14 articles based on citizen petitions generated via the platform. So, Although the drafting process was largely closed to the public and relatively tightly controlled by political actors, this did not frustrate political input, um, public input, and possibly because the participatory process had already garnered quite a lot of momentum. Um, so, or on the participatory tools that were used were quite effective and generated new and innovative constitutional ideas. Now let's get on to the to the to the most complicated but arguably most fascinating case in Chile. Uh, Chile tried in some ways to 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 square the circle by attempting to combine deliberation and mass participation. Uh, President Batch Bachelet at the time launched the process as a response to long um, simmering demands for constitutional change. Uh, now, the first part of the process was an online survey, um, um, which generated more than 90,000 responses. The second step was a deliberative process starting with small deliberative assemblies at the local levels uh, called cabildos. And these were self-convened local meetings uh, composed of 10 to 30 people. Um, more than 8,000 of these meetings were held in more than 10, um, with more than 10,000 um, participants. And these, um, <clears throat> these uh, initial meetings were then followed by larger deliberative fora at the municipality level and at the regional level. And finally, more than 218,000 um, citizens participated in the process. And all of these deliberations were structured along guidelines provided by the government. And the results of each of these assemblies were uploaded onto an um, online platform feeding into a consolidated data set. Um, now, the goal of the process was to get people talking about constitutional issues and to use um, the outcomes of the debates to produce, produce a, a body of core constitutional concepts, which were to guide the drafting process. Um, and now, although there's no official data on this, um, judging from my interviews with participants, the deliberative aspect um, was a huge success. The constitution eventually became a, a national debate and even those against constitutional re reform felt that this was a very useful ex civic exercise. Um, it was pretty wide in range and also suffered less from the self-selection bias uh, of other mass participation processes. But the key challenge here was the analysis of the mass of unstructured data that was produced. And also because data analysis only came as an afterthought and uh, had to be developed on an ad hoc basis in a very short time frame. Um, I don't have the time to go into the details now, but I'm happy to answer any questions on that later in the Q&A. Um, now, eventually, the drafting process was held behind closed doors, and this arguably sucked out the life of um, the, the participatory effort. 
Um, and while the draft reflects some of the ideas raised during the participation process, it's unclear how the appointed experts accounted for the public input. And this alienated the public um, who were not able to clearly trace the input in the constitution and politicians as well who felt that public participation and the drafting of the constitution itself was an act of political maneuvering. So ultimately the, the, the constitution was not adopted. Um, the story is not over though. Uh, in October last year, Chile was hit by a nationwide uh, protest, as many of you know, um, uh, which um, uh, among other um, things <clears throat> called for constitutional reform. And the interesting thing is that citizens spontaneously revived the cabildos from the particip uh, participation process, deliberating on a solution for the crisis. So the process clearly had a societal impact and we will see um, in the new constitution making process if corona doesn't stop it and um, how this will turn out. Um, <clears throat> now let me quickly um, go to my initial questions. Does participation have an impact? So at first glance yes, um, public participation appears to have an impact on text. You know a superficial um, comparison between uh, the public input and the changes in constitutional text suggests that participation does indeed bring about new and innovative constitutional ideas. Um, of course, we can't establish a statistically 100% viable relationship between public input and text and um, input can also have broader impact um, for instance by changing the attitudes of drafters which can probably only be measured by qualitative means. Um, also, there's no objective criteria to measure the quality of a constitutional text. But if our normative um, um, standpoint is that better text did indeed uh, become better. So, um, much uh, what is less clear is whether participation also helps to foster ownership uh, or creates a common sense of values and possibly a sense of community or and, and indeed strengthen democratic systems. Um, arguably such societal input is, is much more intangible and harder to measure, but, uh, and can probably only be done um, reliably uh, by means of a post hoc and long-term analysis. But I think that some insights could be achieved via a qualitative analysis while the process is uh, ongoing, um, or via a kind of debrief um, after a process through surveys and polling, for instance. Now, um, there are some inherent just, limits of... Just one minute left, Felix, sorry. Oh, one minute. Okay, just very quickly, quickly uh, rush through this. Um, there are inherent limits that we have to be very careful um, about. This self-selection uh, is a massive problem in mass participation and policymakers will have to pay particular attention to finding ways of diversifying demographic, uh, the demographic of participants in these processes. The second limiting key factor is um, information overload. And this goes both for um, citizens' participation. Um, the, the more information overload there is, the less meaningful debates uh, can be and the less uh, diversity we will have. And this also poses a problem for drafters in constitution making. Um, I'm part of a project at the moment at the Alan Turing Institute where we are trying to solve these problems or, attack, or tackle some of these problems through um, machine learning tools. And if you're interested, you can check it on, on, on our website. And then there are a couple of textual limitations that we always have to kind of keep in mind. Um, mass participation will always need to be embedded in a more comprehensive participatory uh, design approach. And we have to be aware of, um, of political, uh, we have to look very detailed where and how um, public participation makes a difference. It makes much more of a difference in rights provisions than in more technically, legal technically difficult um, provisions of the constitution. We will need, need elites because constitutions are after all a political um, matter as much as a legal matter. We need agreement and that needs also to be, be done behind closed doors sometimes and the context always matters we need to kind of really try to make sure um, that the that the constitution making process is always tightly embedded in 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 a in a good relationship between um, existing representative institutions 
um, and, and, and these tools. And I think I'll leave it with this. Um, sorry for running over slightly. <laughs>